What, what about the, the massive cocaine addiction that you had last year in May? Sorry, cocaine? Um, I think, I, I, think I, I can think back to the stories that you're talking about. Yeah, um, I'd like to jump straight to my defence here, really, because, uh, well, quite frankly, they're, they're not true. Um, we, cocaine did get found in my Cotswolds home. Um, I was actually caught on the scene. The cocaine wasn't, wasn't mine, and um, me and Mrs Vigner had just gone out for a, a movie and a, you know, a nice... Mexican tapas sort of meal, and um, I come home and just got well. I got caught in the act. They found it in the garage, and they took me straight down to my local cell and um, questioned me from there. Mark, Mark, it wasn't just a small amount. It was it, it, it was, was five point four kilos. Um, no, uh, Brad, sorry, it wasn't. It wasn't that much, Brad. Um, I don't know where you got the stats from. Um, I've, Mark, Marvin, I've, I've seen the police I've, report. It's um, I, I don't. I, I think you. Uh, I, I don't think it's right, Brad. Um, I've got a lot of um, banana Nesquik in my cupboards, and I think they accidentally added that number onto the amount of cocaine that was found in my Cotswolds home. There was one time where um, I actually met uh, my good friend Mark Mark Bosnich at a comedy gala in Hammersmith. Uh, Australian comedians all come together once a year, and they do this. Um, do this sort of, you know, really good comedy night, and Mark Bosnich invited me down there. He, I met him at the tube station, actually, and he, he arrived in his um, goalkeeper gloves, a pair of Roishes. Um, I, could, well, I couldn't stop laughing at the guy. I mean, he, uh, he, had, he always had safe hands, didn't he? Um, anyway, I met him there, and we, we went in, and uh, we had a couple of bottles of uh, Modelo, as you do. Modelo? Uh, Modelo? 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 Um, it's a Mexican beer, anyway. You'll have to double-check that. Um, we went in there and we'd had a few of them and Mark said, um, he said, do you, do you want to go to the toilet, Marv? And I said, well, I said, I can go, I can go to the bloody toilet on my own, um, Mark. I can go to the toilet on my own. You, what, do you need me to, you know, hold, hold your cock while you've got your goldie gloves on sort of thing? I didn't, wasn't sure what was going on. Anyway, we, we went into this toilet and it was, it was pretty quiet and uh, they had one of those guys that sprays the um, aftershave on you, you know, and you give them two, three pound bloody, bloody rip off. Um, we went in, well, he, he forced me into one of the cubicles and I started, th he's a, well, he's a happily married man with kids, I thought, and uh, I started questioning his sexuality in the split seconds and I, well, I got a little bit um, excited. Uh, anyway, we went into the cubicle and um, he got something out of his pocket and it, well, I thought it, it looked like a bag of banana Nesquik and um, I was all a bit, I was all a bit surprised, and I was like, "Why are you drinking banana milkshake here, Mark? You know, we're we're at a comedy gala. You can go and have your fun with a bottle of Malado or Modelo, as I say." And um, we, uh, well, I eventually found out that it was Class A cocaine. I um, actually sniffed a couple of lines off his index finger of his Roche goalkeeper glove. So, um, so you, sorry, you do admit taking um, cocaine? I I do admit, Brad, that I've taken cocaine a couple of times off of Mark Bosnich's index finger at the comedy gala um, and that was a, and and I'm not going to lie I had a few times when I would come home and Mrs Vinegar had been calling me all night she'd been saying where have you where have you been Marv where have you been I've been worried about you she's she's finished her lasagna and she's 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 all het up and she pours her wine down the sink and rushes up to bed and leaves me to feed the cats and um, I Actually, um, I've had a few lines off the breakfast bar, and then I used to sit with the cats and shaking big, big, big eyes like the cats. And we used to watch Holby City deep into the hours. Um, and it was it was a tough time. And Mrs. Vinegar never actually found out, um, which was which was the good thing. But um, so you do admit that you were found in possession of um, these um, numerous kilos of cocaine. Not um, I've. I admit to taking cocaine a couple of times, um, but n um, getting caught with it uh, was all a one big misunderstanding. But Marvin, you were released on bail. S sorry, sorry, Brad. Uh, can I just stop you there? I've, I'm I'm sick of this. I've I didn't sign up for this shit. I didn't sign up for this fucking shit. Fucking hell! What the fuck is he doing? Thanks for rejoining us, Marvin. That's okay, Bradley. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you uh, for having me back in. I was sorry about the um, sorry about that tantrum that I've just had there. Um, I think it's best if we just glance over this this issue. It's obviously quite sensitive for you. Uh, yeah, um, I'd appreciate actually if we didn't talk about any more class A drugs, 
Mark Bozic's index finger or any form of Nesquik. Thank you. So you employed another sports journalist, Christian Loach, to take yeah. Marvin's place. How did he perform? Did he get on well with the players? Um, yeah, no, he wasn't too bad. He's a nice man, and he had his different. He wasn't. He wasn't like Marvin, you know. Marvin, he was a part of the team. He came down and he watched the game. There's nothing bad against him. He was. He was a nice guy, and he's a bit, bit, bit different again, like Marvin. But he used to. I think he loved fishing and always brought, always brought down bananas. I mean, half time we wanted to cut up oranges, you know. But uh, no, no, he wasn't the same as Marvin. But he, he's a very nice man. I think he's just lack, lacked in a bit of experience, really. That's all. Not nice guy. He was good at what he does, but um, yeah, just not a bit more experience needed, I think. I think it was a Saturday afternoon. He obviously he wasn't go karting. He, he was actually sitting in Hyde Park next to one of the one of the ponds, and he. Uh, He'd had, he's got the two bunches of bananas next to him. Um, they had all, all the bananas had been peeled. I think it was about 16 to 18 bananas. And uh, he had a fishing rod set up next to him with maggots and things. And he, and he, I saw it, he, he sort of stripped, he said, he gave me a nod and he, he started stripping down. Um, a few, few minutes later, he was, he was in his leather thong, um, laying down. Um, basically rubbing these bananas into his skin. He was rubbing bananas and developing uh, an erection, developing an erection whilst rubbing these bananas in. And he was, and he, he called another guy over and he asked him to put the maggots, the, the bait, put the bait onto him as well. So he had, he was covered in bananas and um, fish bait. Um, and it was all, it was all very disturbing. And that's all I've got to say about Christian, Christian Loach. All, all I can say is if you're watching, um, just keep an eye out for him. If you do see him, don't take your kids anywhere near him and don't you dare show him any fish or go fishing with him and just, you know, just avoid him at all costs, I'd say. So, yeah, keep away from Christian Loach. So did you see Marvin after you had to let him go from Only Lane FC? Um, not really. You know, I, I had to... Um, I can't couldn't really be in contact with him whilst... He had stuff stuff going on in his life, which would give Only Lane a bad name and give the club a made it, made the club be seen in a bad light. You know, I I I'd get phone calls from him, but I could not I couldn't answer. I I'd, I bumped into it a few times because obviously we live live near each other, and I mean I know the guy like sausages, but he had it he had his whole basket loaded up with sausages, and I think three large um, large packets of cheese he had in his basket, but. I couldn't, couldn't talk to him, I had to walk away and it was hard for me because he, he's not only um, someone who works for us but he's a very good friend of mine so I couldn't, it was quite hard and it was weird seeing him like that and seeing him that way. So Marvin, you, after you realised your cocaine addiction you checked yourself into rehab which is a very admirable thing I must say. I, I did indeed, yes, thank you. How was rehab for you, how did you find it? Um, it was it was a very tough experience for me. Obviously, checking myself in, at least I uh, I acknowledged that I had a problem and uh, I needed time away from Mark. Me and Mark had been seeing each other three three times a week. Mrs. Vinegar was getting quite concerned and she didn't want me seeing him. That's a different story. She she tells me what to do and I don't I don't agree with that. But anyway, I checked myself in for a break away from Mark and away from cocaine and. Nesquik and sausages really as well. I needed a break from sausages, they were getting out of hand and I was eating more of those, as I say, getting them delivered to my garage. And then you decided to make a drastic career change. Um, I did indeed, Brad. Tell yes. me about that. I'd had a lot of thinking time, as I say, in the in the rehab. Um, I was, it was one time they gave me a foot spa, um, they gave me a foot spa to um, in the evening, and um, it was a Wednesday evening, I think it was in February. It was a cold, cold evening, and they they gave me a little bit of free time. They gave me this foot spa, and I put my feet in there, and I looked down, and I, I you know, twinkled my toes, and uh, I thought football isn't for me anymore. I, I spent too much time with Mark, and he he put me off football really. He was a obviously he was a heavy drug man, and spent too much time with him, and I decided that. I was going to pursue a childhood dream of mine to become a marine biologist and I was going to go in search for the leafy sea dragon. I wanted to go and find it and I wanted to study marine life and go and search the world for a leafy sea dragon. So I decided to hang up my boots as I say. I didn't obviously wear boots. I was, I was a big lover of 
Puma suede bumpers, of course. But um, I hung up my boots and, uh, well, Puma or bumpers, hung up my bumpers and uh, just, I just decided to go down the marine biologist's route and that's where, it all, that's where it all changed for me. Okay, so Marvin, how did the changing career into marine biology go for you? How was that? Um, well, to be honest, Brad, it didn't actually go too well. It, um, it lasted around eight days, in fact. Um, I was misinformed. I was told, um, I was told by my tutor, obviously because I was studying, um, I was told by my tutor that I could find a leafy sea dragon off the coast of um, Vietnam and uh, I jetted off there the next day. I thought, I want to go and find this. I want to get it in a net and put it in a bag and bring one home for me and my Afro-Caribbean kids to enjoy. So I, I jetted straight out there. Um, not knowing about any jabs I needed or anything like that and um, I flew out to Vietnam and uh, actually developed a, quite a bad illness and uh, it didn't hit me for a while. I flew whilst in Vietnam I found out that the leafy sea dragon was off the coast of Australia so I jetted straight there three da after three days of Vietnam and uh, arrived in um, Perth um, to find the leafy sea dragon um, and that's where I started to develop developing an illness and um, I was getting very tired and I was, I was dizzy, I was, you know, I was, I was raiding, raiding the supermarkets for tablets and things and I couldn't, I couldn't find anything, I just found myself eating pepper armies. I was eating a lot of pepper armies to try, I thought that would cure, the, cure this, these headaches I was getting but it wasn't working so I, I, Mrs Vinegar called me home and I, I came home and that was the end of my marine biologist um, career which was a shame. It, Obviously, after eight days, it's, uh, it's a bitter, swill to bitter, bitter, bitter pill to swallow. So, how did it come about, Marvin, returning to Ernie Lane as their personal sports journalist? Um, I think it was around eight months I lost contact with him, and I had a phone call from him, which I wouldn't normally answer, but I thought um, everything had passed, and I wasn't too sure, so I answered and I said, like. Hello mate, how are you? And straight away I know, you know, like you know what Marvin like straight away I knew he was back and he was fine and and he was he was the man he used to be before everything else. So I knew straight away he was he was fine. So we arranged to meet, had a chat with him and he he brought up team he you know, watched a few games where we didn't really know about and he brought down his notes of the game and um yeah, it was like his his old self and we went through him and we had the same ideas again and his passion for the lane and his his work was there, so we um, decided to take him take him on board. His attitude just it was just it's 110 percent. He came down every week, and he just got better. His job he, he made the boys laugh. What, what I like about it, he makes the boys laugh, and he, they they love him, and so so does everyone else. And his his work grew with that. You know, he he come down and. He just gives 110% effort all the time and he's just, he's just got to different levels.